I went into computer science because I'm a girl and I wanted a career. In the 1950s and the 1960s, women just were, were housewives and I wanted to be able to take care of myself. Hello and welcome to Tools and Craft, the show where we talk with engineers, inventors, and designers who shaped computing as we know it. I'm your host, Devin Zugel, and today we're talking with Pamela Hart English. Pam was the driving force behind Resource One, a people's computing center in San Francisco in the early 1970s, and they were at the epicenter of counterculture. She acquired, operated, and maintained a mainframe computer and hosted it at the technological commune she called home. Resource One was part of the earliest vanguard of personal networked computing. Pam's work made computers accessible to groups who didn't think of themselves as computer users, including social workers and hippies, and she anticipated the rise of the internet that happened decades later. So thanks for joining me, Pam. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Me too. So after you were studying computer science at Berkeley, you went and moved into Project One, which was a commune. When I went to college, I started in math and I moved over to computer science because it was just starting as a field. In fact, it was a bachelor's of arts, but it was a field where women were welcome. There weren't enough people. And I knew that I'm good at math and I thought that would be a good opportunity for me. I'm really curious, what was the initial spark of the idea to have a mainframe in the commune? You have to have the context of what was going on in time. It's very similar to what's going on right now. It was our brothers, our friends that were going to Vietnam. And it was disproportionately minorities going to Vietnam and being killed. And why were they being killed? They're being killed because the United States wanted to rule things and was so afraid that China would make Vietnam communist. And from our point of view as, as young people, you know, it was old men making decisions that were sending young men off to war. And that was a draft. There wasn't an option. It wasn't a volunteer army at that point. So when I went to Berkeley, the free speech movement was just ending and the anti-war movement was just starting. So I spent my first three years on strike a lot of the time. And when we tried to get people like professors in the math department to join us, they said, you know, we just finished World War II. All we want is to do our work. We just want peace and quiet. There was a divide. You know, our parents, we felt, were passive in allowing this war to go on. People just in Vietnam just wanted to run their own lives. And we couldn't understand it. So so that was the context. And there were two other men in the computer science department that I was in, Chris Macy and Chris Neustrup. And the three of us heard about this Project One. And we really wanted to do something with the technology that was useful to people. Not to killing people, but to making lives better. And the three of us went over to explore that. And Chris Macy and I stayed. And we, our idea was to have a computing center that could share resources. It was resource, exchanging resources and knowing what was going on. What we wanted to do is what you can easily do now with Google. That if someone needed a health service, you could just type in on a shared network, I need this, I need that. But at that time, there weren't any of those services and there was very little time sharing going on. So it wasn't an idea that I had. It was an idea that was floating in the, in the universe of young people at that time, of technical people with technical backgrounds that wanted to do something useful. There was also science for the people. There were all sorts of organizations that said, hey, we're not putting our resources to supporting the world in a positive way. And we want to change that. That's fascinating because I guess previously before that, people, all of these services were mediated by institutions where you had to go ask somebody for a pointer to something else. And in, am I right in describing it as you, you wanted to bring it to individuals so that they could sort of direct those resources themselves? Exactly. I mean, all you had in the past was a phone book. So if you wanted a resource, you had a phone book and you didn't know how to contact the right person to talk to there. Mm -hmm. And we also had in, in Project One was a switchboard, one of those old fashioned switchboards that you plug in when people call. And it was set up, uh, the Haight-Ashbury switchboard, 
as kind of a way to communicate uh, with parents because of hippies that came out to the West and then their parents are trying to find them and there's just no way of connecting. People could leave messages. So it was a, a way of connection. And what we wanted was a way for the technology to be more useful to individuals in the community. How did Google end up being different from how you envisioned this system? Well, it's actually really very, very similar to what we wanted. It's just we were, you know, 50 years ahead of the times. <laughs> you know, we, that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted people to be able to connect to each other and to services that they needed. And as you know, one of the problems with the phone book, first of all, it's, it's static. It's frequently out of date. And it doesn't take the next step, which is actually connecting you with the right person. It just gives you kind of a, you know, a blunt look of something that you might need, like a tire store or a health or something. Right. That makes sense. And I suppose also with Google, you can also go in and read the information. You don't initially have to have someone on the other line. And so if you call somebody, if you call the tire store, well, if they're not open, then they're not open uh, and you just have to call back tomorrow. Whereas with Google, you can look at their website and see what their prices are or you know what, what their address is. Right. And, and also, I think the other part of the mentality is that things were very top down at that time. People made decisions for people, for the betterment of people, whereas we thought people should make decisions for themselves. And, and that's a common thought now. But for instance, when my mother had children, fathers were not allowed. Mothers had to stay in the hospital for seven days. They frequently were given drugs so that they wouldn't have pain, you know, spinal blocks, all for the betterment of the woman. And women were told not to nurse because you couldn't measure you couldn't measure the amount of milk they were getting if you nursed, that that was bad. And rather than talking to women about what they needed. And so that concept of talking to the user, so to speak, is common now, but it wasn't 50 years ago. I mean, my own mother-in-law, who's the kindest woman, she said, Pam, you shouldn't be nursing. How can you know that Stephen is doing well? I said, because he's driving, he's not crying. <laughs> you know, but that was that was their mentality at that time. So what we wanted and we operated the, the building as by consensus. The idea was that you shouldn't have some dictator, one person telling everybody what to do, thinking they know best for everybody. We wanted a more diffuse leadership. How did that impact the kinds of decisions you ended up making? You asked about, you know, how did we get the, the computer? There were other resources in the community that helped us go that direction. So, uh, for instance, Mr. Uh, Clausen was president of Bank of America when the students at University of Santa Barbara burned it down. And he was appalled that this could happen, that he could be so disconnected to the community that he served. So he set up a group of business people, including Transamerica, the CEOs, top people in San Francisco, to find a way to work with young people. So that was one component. A second was a group called Pacific Change. And these were the sons and daughters of wealthy people who wanted to do good in the community, who wanted to be, you know, different. And maybe that's how we connected to this group of businessmen. I'm not 100% sure. But they gave us some guidance or gave me some guidance as to how to approach these people about what we wanted to do. We knew what we wanted to do, which, you know, we wanted to create a computer center that could be used by the community that had terminals around the city so that people could access what they wanted. So we knew what we wanted. We needed help figuring out how to get there. These two groups helped us. I think it was Pacific Change that helped me because, you know, I'm only, I was only, what, 21, 22. What did I know about fundraising? And we needed about $100,000 and we needed a computer. So I think they gave me some training as to how to approach these people. But because Mr. Clausen had set up this group, it made it a group of people I could go see. And that include Transamerica, which had just decommissioned this SDS 940, uh, which is also called an XDS 940. It's very cool that and very meta 
that you built up this network of people to give you sort of one-on-one advice to then go procure a machine that ended up sort of achieving that same goal as well. Just for context for people listening, the SDS 940 was not your typical MacBook where you just walk into an Apple computer store or uh, anything like that. It was I think when I looked it up, it was like $150,000 in the 1970s, and there were only 57 of them that were ever made. And it took a lot of space. We had to build a, a room, you know, now, right, you, it probably has just as much power in our in our phones. But at that time, we had to build a space. We were in a concrete abandoned candy factory. So we had to build a space that had no dust because we had magnetic tape air conditioning, and we had to install all of that by ourselves. <laughs> In fact, Paul Ward was our electrician. And, you know, he was, again, like about 20, 21 years old. And I said, Paul, were you an electrician before you came to Resource One? Because he did all the electrical work. He said, no, Pam, I didn't know anything. I went to the library and learned. Wow. So all of us were, were novices in what we were doing, but we had that dedication, passion, and it, and people were smart to put it together. And he didn't even have YouTube. That's really impressive. No, he had the library. We got a, a lot of people that were uh, just misfits other places in life, and they were all welcome. We did have people that had, uh, you know, mental illness, for instance. And I think in general, there was a lot of kindness. And we had a high school and we had a daycare center a lot of artists, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of different people who worked hard in their own way. And each, each kind of group was independent. I mean, nobody told me what to do in Resource One. And I didn't tell the optic nerve people who were the video people what they should do or any of the artists. The only time we came together to have discussions was about our communities as a whole. You mentioned that Project One, the commune, was located in an abandoned candy factory. How did that warehouse environment impact the culture of the community? Well, you know, it was just fantastic because it it, it almost looked like a, a, a parking garage. You know, there's nothing in it, but, you know, these big concrete pillars and several floors. And so we had to put up walls. We had to build spaces. We had to do everything. And so it was wonderful, men and women, everybody working together. And we all had to, to clean bathrooms. You know, we, we did everything communally, also um, made decisions by consensus, which is torture because that means meetings are very, very long. But it was a wonderful environment to be in because everybody could do everything. And we had people, we had architects and people who were really qualified to teach the rest of us how to do things. But those skills gave all of us, particularly women, such confidence to be able to put up walls and do electrical work, do plumbing, do everything. It was it was really a wonderful environment. And then in terms of structure, again, because the times were so uh, volatile, people, you know, would come into the building police or and, and they would say, who's in charge? And we would take pride in saying, no one's in charge or we're all <laughs> in charge. <laughs> How do they react to that? Not too badly. Um, you know, but sometimes, you know, there would be circling helicopters over the building, but we didn't really have that much trouble with the, with the city. You know, there were no raids or anything like that. We did have a lot of communal meetings because we had to make decisions. My brother graduated from college and my brother is a person who always has polished shoes and always dresses well. And in the building, of course, everybody is dusty and dirty and nobody uh, but he had, he was out of college and out of a job. And it was one of those poor economic times. So he came to live with me for a couple of months and he had to clean bathrooms like everybody else. And really motivated him to go back to graduate school to get a business. <laughs> it was the worst couple of months in his life. <laughs> wow. I have a hard time imagining living in San Francisco without heat. That, that cold, damp fog really just like clings to you. <laughs> Wow. Someone who lived in your commune once wrote, I have watched my hands use so many different tools that at times I couldn't answer people who asked me what I did for a living. 
How did that shape the way that you approached living in Project One and working on Resource One? It gave us confidence that we could do anything. You know, as a young person, I think you feel you can do most anything. But seeing the the fruits of our labor, making nothing into something, gave us gave us a lot of confidence. How long uh, did it take for you guys to, to get the thing set up and functional? You know, that's an interesting question because I've asked a couple of people, and it was months. Not years, but I don't, I can't tell you exactly how long. I don't know. And I, and I've asked a couple of the other people who were there because, you know, when you're building something, you just keep doing it. You know, you don't think of the days that go by. For instance, when I went to graduate school, I gave myself a year. Well, it took three years, but in my mind, it was always a year from today. Three years just seemed too enormous. So anyway, we I don't know exactly how long it took, but it was months. And people came in as we needed them. The ECOs, which was the group that started at Ralph Scott, started Project One, they would go out and talk to other groups and of people, and people would get interested. You know, so there wasn't uh, again the internet to to plug into, but people talked to each other, and so people would just float in to Project One, and then. If they were technical or interested, they might float into resource one. And we ended up getting all the people we needed. I talked to, for instance, Henry the Fiddler, professional fiddler, and he just loved cleaning. Well, nothing is more important than cleaning in a computer center like that. And he he kept the floors perfect and the dust level down. When I look back, it's amazing how we found all the right people. And Steve Robinson was a finance guy, but who also wanted to put his skills to doing something useful in the community. And so he helped us with budgets and things like that. Were there any moments where you thought, man, I really wish we had someone with such and such skill? And if so, how did you end up solving that problem? No, they just seemed to arrive. We just, we had the people that we needed. And then we, you know, like I, I'm not a great programmer. This is what I wanted to do, but programming is not something that I particularly like, but we had excellent programs like Chris, Chris Macy, who came over with me and then Lee Felsenstein are really good programmers. So they could make the computer do what we wanted it to do. That's amazing. Yeah, I think if, if you have a good project, something especially with a good cause, it just attracts people to you, people who want to help and give input and provide resources and time. So that's, there's something just magnetic about it. I, I think that's true. And it's not like we were getting paid money. Like I, I was working, I, I had a shared job washing uh, beakers at the University of San Francisco that I would do at night. I shared with another woman because I mean, our expenses weren't high. We were only paying, I think, about five cents a square foot. And we were living in the building. So they weren't high, but of course we needed to eat. I'm not even sure if we ever paid salaries. I'm just not sure about that. I have to ask our account guy. Project One and and Resource One were definitely run on a a tight budget. And so the $150,000 price tag of the SDS 940 was probably out of range. You, you mentioned that you spoke with some business people who gave you advice on how to procure it. What was the actual process for, for getting in? Like, what, what was the advice that they gave you? Well, I think the, the advice came more from Pacific Change, and the contacts of who we should talk to came from Mr. Clausen and his group. We didn't want to pay for anything, so and we didn't pay for the computer. They delivered it to us. It was decommissioned, so we weren't buying it. They weren't going to use it. It had been used by a, a company called Timeshare. I think it's T-Y-M-E Share. So they donated, Transamerica donated it to us and delivered it to us. So the, it, the money we needed was operating money, which was the, uh, about $100,000. Bank of America gave us $25,000. And so we were looking for money in $25,000 chunks. And I went and talked to a zillion people. Fortunately, I was talking to the right people that had money, and they, and I was talking to the foundations of these corporations, not to the corporations. What were the emissions of the re- respective foundations, and how did they fit in with what Project One was doing? I think we just told them what we wanted to do, that we wanted to make this computer center available to people in the community. And that's what foundations are for, is to be supportive of, of people, of something, you know. 
Corporations are there to make a profit. And then the foundations are set up to give a small percentage back. So if you just came with sort of a charter of this is what we're trying to do, they could look at that and say, this, this seems great. We'll do that. Yeah. And you have to, to realize the discord in the country at that time. In the early 70s, there were many more bombings than we have ever experienced right now. Most of them were not fatal bombings, but just there was so much discontent in the country where people were so unhappy with the government and they were, and we were being lied to all of the time. So people who, who saw this saw us as doing something positive in the community. One of the big goals behind having the mainframe in the commune was so that you'd have your own access to it and so that you could put teletypes all around the city so other people could have access to it. What about your behavior and other users' behavior did you expect to change? We just thought it would give people the freedom and the flexibility to do what they needed to do in a convenient way. Honestly, I left Resource One before it got moved over and became community memory. And that was Lee Felsenstein's uh, project. We, we were limited by our own technology. We couldn't get to what where I wanted to be in the 1970s. But people like Lee Felsenstein, the real, you know, hardware, software people, they continued working for years to get to, to that point. If I had done it, something else in technology, the next thing I wanted to do was to buy a satellite because I thought once the war is over in Vietnam, they'll need to set up all this infrastructure and they'll need to have be able to communicate with each other and to and the best way to do that is with satellites. And I wanted to buy a used satellite that could then be used rather than putting cables through the jungle. But again, mm -hmm. a lot of these things were just not available in the 70s. Wow, that sounds a lot like Project Loon that Google ended up doing in the last 10 or so years. What gave you the idea that that would even be a possibility? Like, How did that cross your mind? Just why not? <laughs> That's fantastic. So you, you mentioned community memory was one of the projects that was built on top of that foundation you created with Resource One. Can you speak a little bit more to that and, and sort of what you know about it? Two things happened after I left. One is the way that computer got used is creating a resource directory that people subscribe to. And so three women, Sherry Reason, Mary Janowitz, and Joan Leftowitz, work together to create this directory using the computer, which is then easy to update. And people would then subscribe to that. And they use that to support themselves for, for a period of years. And the computer got moved to the San Francisco library where Joan worked. And so it got used in that way while people were in trying to improve the technology so that, you know, it could be more, more interactive than it really was. And when you say they moved the computer to the library, did they mo move the entire mainframe or was it just primarily the, the teletype type terminal itself? My understanding is they moved the whole thing. Hmm. What's a way that somebody used community memory or, or just the mainframe in the primary commune that surprised you? What surprised me is not in the positive, but just it just couldn't do as much as I, I wanted it to do. What were the limitations? The limitations were the teletype terminals. It wasn't as interactive as I would have liked. You know, at that point, one of, one of my colleagues, uh, Robert Shapiro, you know, when you write a, a document and you have an outline and you go A, B, and then you go inside, inside. Well, you know, we can't do that with information. It takes forever. So you have to find other ways of accessing the information. Well, that software was not that well developed at that time. There were software as well as hardware limitations as to what, how interactive it could be. Did you feel like it would be decades away or did it feel like something that was just on the tip of your tongue that if there's a little bit more work done, what did that feel like? You know, I really didn't know how long it would take to get there. I know that I was disappointed that we couldn't do more than we could do at that time. And then, you know, you reach different points in your life. I was ready to do something different. And I felt I had, you know, the part I really enjoyed was building resource one and then taking it to the next step, which other people did, like Lee, with community memory, wasn't what I wanted to do at that time. That's why I left. And then I had to, you know, explore what I wanted to do. So I went to work for Robert Shapiro, who's another tremendous software person. 
and did some programming for him. And while we were working together on the political side, because he was he also believed in technology for the people and science for the people, we looked at how computers were used in in the world at that time. So that was what mid seventies, like nineteen seventy four. We first place we looked at was the dairy industry. The computers were used in the dairy industry for artificial insemination. And we did a lot of research in that area. And it was also the time of the Green Revolution. And that's when I realized, you know, this is really interesting and it's important. You know, we have overpopulation in the world with the Green Revolution going on. And it was an area I wanted to learn more about. So I went back to graduate school and I didn't want to just be in food science. Because, again, I was a girl and I was afraid I'd get stuck in a lab somewhere. So that's why I went into engineering and food science and got a double master's so that I I would be an engineer and a food scientist. And so for me, that was fantastic because I got to work all over the world solving problems. So it was a good fit for me. In fact, you know, one of the things I thought about when you asked that question about uh, the Internet is in my travels as a, as a food scientist, even though, you know, I talk to people uh, on the Internet and we share r- reports, et cetera, when you're in a plant or say, for instance, when I was doing all this work in China, I would get up at six in the morning and just walk in the streets. And it would be so wonderful to watch people getting up in the morning. You know, you'd see people squatting in front of the, the drainage ditch in front of the buildings, brushing their teeth and then people opening up the the doors, kind of like garage doors to their little stores, and they were in the back. And it, and you just get a, uh, there's an intimacy of being there that you don't get on the, with just the internet. It's kind of like the difference between having coffee with a friend and having a Zoom meeting with a friend. You know, you, you connect, but you just connect in a more intimate way when you're, when you're actually there. What is something young people take for granted about technology that for you, when, when you were in your 20s, was a big frustration or a big limitation? Well, when I went to college, we had to use Fortran, where punch cards. And I'm an imperfect person. You know, I'm not a detail fanatic. And so I always had one typographical error. And there was so much demand on the computers that, you know, you couldn't get your deck of cards until midnight. And if there was one error, you had to go correct it and then resubmit it. It took forever to run programs. So that was a big frustration in college. I remember my my dad, he also went to college around that time with, with punch cards. He was racing to get to his time slot to be with the machine, and he tripped, and he spilled all of his cards all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> and, uh, and he had to go sort them. I think that they weren't numbered or something, so he had to like figure out how to sort them back. Sounds extremely frustrating. <laughs> it was just so, so difficult to do. But yeah, punch cards were the word. <laughs> and now it's so nice. I mean, look at the things that you, you all are doing. It's so much more user friendly. People can work on websites that are not technical people. Everything's been made so much more uh, friendly. It's just fantastic, don't you think? It is pretty great. Yeah. The big problem is people reacting all the time instead of thinking and responding carefully and not knowing what the truth is in terms of chatter, which I don't think is a problem in your area in the computing because, you know, you're working as a team, you all have the same goal. But in society, it's clearly become a big problem of knowing what's true and what's not true. Yeah. I mean, very related to that. Resource One was described as a, a, quote, testament to the way computer technology could be used as guerrilla warfare for people against bureaucracies. But until that point, computers were massive mainframes, almost exclusively owned by corporations and institutions. What did you see that others didn't, that that they had this potential to be a personal computing device and a, a networked computing device? Well, like I said, it wasn't just me. It was a feeling of a lot of technical people like myself that what you're saying is true, that the people who are using computers were not using it for people. They were using it for business and military aims. And that our job as young technical people was to find a way to use it for people. In all of science, there were people doing that. I mean, that was the beginning of it, you know, and looking at the environment. And it wasn't, we weren't talking about climate change, but destruction of the environment with uh, monoculture 
in agriculture. We're coming up to towards the end of our time, so I'll just ask one last question. And that question is, what what should I have asked you? What what about resource one? Uh, do people not really understand? I think what what's been nice for me, having reflecting from you asking those questions earlier, is just how how everybody arrived as needed in resource one to do what was needed, and then how their lives unfolded after that in so many different ways which were enriched by the fact that we had to build our own walls, or build our own space, raise our own money, and work together as a team. I think that broadened all of our horizons. Well, this was an incredibly fun conversation, Pam. Thank you for taking time on a Saturday morning to chat. Hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. You too. Bye. To learn more about Pam and hear about the next episode of Tools and Craft, you can go to Notion.so, follow me on Twitter at Devin Zugel, or follow Notion at Notion HQ. Thanks for listening.